Good morning, Family Alive. What's the first thing you complained about? What's the last thing you complained about? First world problems? First world problem. Getting ready to say, start the video and your mic doesn't work. That's exactly what was just happening, which is why I'm wearing Anthony's mic, and I feel like it doesn't even fit me. This is crazy. I don't feel Sri Lankan at all, but I'm wearing his mic. And you know what? I just have to smile. I'm talking about complaining today. <laughs> yep, just got a smile. Just got a smile. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. You see the video there about uh, a complaint, and the video actually goes on, and it's kind of good on the satire. His, his uh, electric toothbrush doesn't work, and he has to brush his teeth like a Neanderthal used to, manually. It's amazing some of the things that we would complain about. What do you think of habitual complainers? What do you think of them when you run into them? Would you want to work for one? Anthony, put your hand down. You don't work for one. <laughs> Would you want to have one work for you? Would you want your child to marry a habitual complainer? Would you want to raise a habitual complainer? And you know, it seems like the holiday season, Christmas and complaining kind of go hand in hand, unfortunately. Maybe you, had a, maybe you had a boatload of complaining going on in your house this past Thanksgiving weekend. I hope not. Would you want your child to marry one? Of course not. But our Christmas season is a tenth of our calendar. Do you realize that? It's a tithe. When you look from, the, from Thanksgiving to uh, Christmas Day, it's about a tenth of our week. And the marketing is all going to be aimed at our complaints. You need this. You don't have this. You should have this. How come they have that and you don't? You deserve this. You might think that Americans were the most complaining people in history until you read the Old Testament. Then you realize the most complaining people in history were the people of Israel. The people of Israel. We're going to pick it up in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And I'm glad my screen's really close because not only is my microphone different, I forgot my glasses and I don't even know where they are right now. <laughs> is that a, I said I'm down over there. Randy, I want those things, man. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I knew I'd set something else down. I thought it was my, Oh, you all look so much better now. <laughs> and I don't look weird anymore, right? I look normal now? Okay, cool. Hey, we're in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Here's the context. Paul, the Apostle Paul is talking and he is summarizing about... Uh, 40 years and six chapters in the Old Testament. He's summarizing it. He's putting it together for us because he knew that Mark Lehman wouldn't have time on Thanksgiving weekend to read all of it. And he says this in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 6. These things, what he's going to refer to in just a moment, they occur as examples to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things as they did. They're an example for us. They're an example. The first example was when Moses went up on the, on the mountain to get the Ten Commandments, and it took took him quite a bit of time, about 40 days. And the people down low started complaining that it took so long. And Paul says that was for an example for us. And said, do not be idolaters as some of them were. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in pagan revelry. And, and the Apostle Paul is quoting there when the people were complaining that it took Moses so long. So the people in essence are saying, God, your timing is not satisfactory. I don't like your timing. And then uh, Paul continues, and he continues talking about the complaining people of Israel in the Old Testament. And the men weren't being satisfied, apparently, by their wives in physical intimacy. So they decided to start getting some action with the local foreign women, which meant that they had to bow down to their gods. And Paul summarizes it as an example and said this, We should not commit sexual immorality as some of them did. Notice, all of them didn't. And in one day, 23,000 of them died. These men that apparently weren't satisfied said, God, your sexual provision is not good enough for me. It's not good enough. I want more. The next one says this in verse 9, another situation. Paul says, we shouldn't test the Lord. Some of them did, and they were killed in the worst way possible by snakes. Everyone that loves snakes, raise your hand. Everyone that thinks that a good snake is a dead snake. Yep, yep. They did not like the menu that God was providing. That's what this complaint was about. They didn't like the food that was being offered that God was providing them in the desert. So they complained, and some of them were killed by snakes. And they said, God, your supply is not good enough. What you're providing does not meet my satisfaction. And then in verse 10, you've got something that, if you're an Old Testament person, you need to understand. It's called the rebellion of Korah. Basically, Korah gets a bunch of people together. They're trying to overthrow Moses because they didn't like how Moses was doing this or that or this or that. And they didn't like Moses. And it says this. And Paul says, this is for our example, do not grumble, as some of them did. They all did, as some of them did. And they were killed by a destroying angel. Basically, these people are saying, God, your leadership's not good enough. Your leadership's not good enough. 
And then Paul continues on in this passage, and this is, this is powerful here. He says this, These things, what I just wrote to you about, they happened to them as examples, and they were written down as warnings for you and me, on whom the fulfillment of the ages has come. So if you think you're standing firm and you got it all together and everything's just going hunky-dory, hey, be careful that you don't fall. And then comes a verse that many of us know. We've heard this verse, and we've, it's been communicated to us like what it means is God will never give you anything you can't handle. It's not accurate. Look at the context that it says. No temptation has seized you. What kind of temptation are we talking about? Well, Paul just started talking about all these situations where people were grumbling and whining and complaining, not being thankful. No temptation has seized you except what is common to man, and God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. All those temptations, they could have bore those. They could have dealt with and not complain about the groceries, about the food, about the sexual provision, about all those things. But when you are tempted, he will provide a way out so you can stand up under it. You notice in all those temptations, it doesn't say everybody did this. It said some of them. There was a way out. Some people didn't want it. And then there's a therefore. And when there's a therefore, you got to find out what it's there for. And what it's there for is as we look back on this, all these temptations to grumble and whine and complain. Therefore, my dear friends, flee from complaining. Flee from whining. Flee flee from idolatry. I thought idolatry was when I took my chainsaw in the backyard, I took a tree, and went, and made something that looked like an ashtray probably, or a mouse or something, and bowed down before it. I thought that was idolatry. Flee from idolatry? I thought we were talking about complaining. If you have your bulletins, I want to give you the main point this morning, which we will break down intensely. But the main point is, if you didn't get a bulletin, lift your hand up, we'll get one to you. To complain... It's to tell God I could do a better job. To complain is to tell God I could do a better job. I'm not happy, God, with what you've given me to do, what you've given me to experience, or the situation you've placed me in. And I'm going to let you know, and the only way that I can, I'm going to let you know and others know in a full frontal verbal assault. To complain is to tell God I could do a better job. There's some thoughts and conversations we have privately, and we don't blurt them out to other people. Hopefully, you had a filter on your mouth over Thanksgiving and certain things and certain people that were in your house, maybe. But Jesus said this in Matthew 1, 2, 3, 4, Matthew 12, 34, for out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. And then he had this to say about our words. Jesus said, the good man brings the good things out of the good stored up in him, and the evil man brings the evil things out of the evil stored up in him. Sounds like a nursery rhyme. But I tell you that men will have to give account on the day of judgment for every careless word they have spoken. So let's take a look at some of the causes. Why do, why, why do we fight this so much? Because anyone here want to raise their hand and say, I never complain? May we please see your hand? Anybody? Okay, so we're all in the same boat. We all struggle with this, and we all are aware of that. Why do we struggle with it? A couple causes. Number one, it's common. It's common. We're broken people. We live in a broken world. The source for complaints is going to be a never-ending, renewable resource in our life. Do you agree with that? We'll always have something to complain about. Do you agree? Are you with me? Okay. Life situations, political decisions, national news. And the scripture tells us to do something that's impossible. Do everything without complaining or arguing. It's not setting us up for failure. It's directing us in the direction we need to aim for. It's not saying, if you do this, you're horrible, you're rotten. What it's saying is, that's what we should aim for. What's going to happen if we do everything without complaining and arguing? We'll become blameless and pure. Children of God without fault in a crooked and depraved generation. That sounds like my generation. In which you will shine like stars in the universe. Instead of standing out like a sore thumb, we will be the only thing that's not sore. And how will we not be the only thing that's not sore and will be healthy? By doing everything without complaining or arguing. Not by how high we lift our hands in worship. Maybe you're already complaining this morning when you walked in and saw that Tyler had a vacation week and, and some other kid that you don't even know was leading worship. That's Brian. He grew up here. What does it say about what's in our heart when complaining comes out so fast? Maybe it says this next thing. One of the causes of complaints is control. Control. If we could have control, we wouldn't complain because the only thing we're complaining about are things that are out of our control. If we could control the conduct of others, Man, that would get rid of a lot of our complaints. If we could control our circumstances, we want what God has, control. And when we complain, we don't think he's using his control very well. And we're telling him, God, I could do a better job. 
Come on, think, think, extrapolate this out. What if you actually had full control of those around you? And what does it say about our heart that we actually wouldn't mind trying that out once in a while? <laughs> Another cause of uh, complaining is it's comfortable. It's comfort. It feels good. It feels really good to complain. Why is it, men, that we scream at the TV when we're watching a football game? Ohio State, Michigan. I screamed at the TV. My son just sits there and watches me in amusement. No, 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 yes, yes, yes. As if my complaint, why do you, why'd you run the ball? As if, but it felt good to do it. Why? Because it, feel it feels good to get it out. It feels good to get it out. The same way cursing does. Scientifically proven. If you want to go ahead and cuss and swear, it'll, feel, it'll relieve pain for an instant. And the more you use it, the less effective it is. I'd say our nation is about out of, uh, out of effective use of the F-bomb. We use it so much, it's no longer beneficial, and we wish we could find something harsher to say to release the anger and angst inside, yet we're not finding anything. You've run across those people before. You don't like running across them, but I just had to get that off my chest. I feel better now. Well, vomiting does the same thing when a person has a sickness in their stomach. Blah, man, I feel so much better now. But everyone around you is freaked out and grossed out. Where is the sickness? If a person is sick in their stomach and they vomit it out and it feels better, where is the sickness of a person who is constantly, habitually complaining? The sickness is in their heart. And why does our heart like that? Why does our heart, our heart doesn't need a helper. It needs a savior. It doesn't need to be turned in a better direction. It needs to be crucified and resurrected in Christ. Last cause of, of, of uh, complaining is comparison. Comparison, a main component of complaining is comparison. We complain about what we don't have because others do have it. I only have this kind of phone, car, house, job, family. How come they get a nicer Phone, car, house, job, family. It's the opposite of thankfulness. If thankfulness is the attitude of gratitude, complaining is the attitude of matitude. But it's unfiltered, so we communicate it. And it has consequences. Number one, contentment remains elusive. You and I, when we complain, we're hoping that we'll change the situation so that we'll be happier, we'll be more content in the situation. But we realize that even if we had control, we wouldn't have full contentment. The other consequence of complaining, which I expect, expect some pushback on, is this. We surrender control to Satan. And I want to say this softly and not harshly. But we're going to look in James chapter 3. When we complain, we are surrendering control to Satan. And some of you already are listening to the enemy's voice and complaining about this message. I don't blame you, because the enemy is going to be flooding you with reasons that I'm wrong, I'm just being mean, blah, blah. He's going to flood you with that, because he loves it when we complain. Let's look at God's word in James chapter 3. When we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. I don't know how often you've been around a horse. They're huge. It doesn't take much to turn it. Although they are so large and driven by strong winds, excuse me, or take ships as an example, Although they are so large and driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. Small rudder, big ship, small rudder guides it. Likewise, in the same way, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. That's where Bruce Springsteen got that line, I think. The tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. Yeesh. It corrupts the whole person. It sets the whole course of his life on fire and is itself set on fire by hell. Yeah. If we could take back some of our actions, we probably would. But if you had a choice to take back an action or take back some words, I think most of us would choose words. A sixth in stones may break my bones, but names will never hurt me is a lie from hell. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and creatures of the sea are being tamed and have been tamed by man. Shamu. But no man can tame the tongue. It's a restless evil, full of deadly poison. Earlier, we were singing. Some of us were. Hopefully you were. We're surrendering our mind and our heart and our words. And if we have any 
tonal qualities, our, our, uh, our melodies, to God to honor him. Who are we surrendering to when we complain? Who are we surrendering our mind and our heart and our words to? The devil loves it when we complain. Something else that's a consequence when we complain. We leak the fruit of the Spirit. We leak. I've heard it said before that vision leaks, which is why we constantly reinforce it. But we leak the fruit of the Spirit. It's like a, a, a bad apple. It starts oozing out. Love, joy, peace. Patience, kindness, goodness. Faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. The fruit of the Spirit. When we complain, we are never exhibiting the fruit of the Spirit. When we are in a complaining mood or a complaining mode, we are in a situation where we are bearing actually the fruit of the flesh, which is listed right before the fruit of the Spirit. It's on the screen there right here. Uh, uh, sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft. I'm not practicing witchcraft when I'm complaining. Some of these may not fit, but a lot of them do. Hatred, discord, jealousy, rage, selfish ambition, faction, envy. We leak the fruit of the Spirit. What it really does, though, when we complain, is exposes the contents of our heart. Jesus nailed it. Man, he nailed it. For out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. I don't know what words come out of your mouth when something bad happens. I've started, because I've been planning this message about a week and a half, I've noticed how much I complain. I've noticed it. And I've tried to catch myself. Because I'm realizing the consequences of it. I realize what it does to the people around me. And I realize that it's really putting me at the center of the universe. And then I'm realizing what I'm actually complaining about. <laughs> it's pathetic. It's totally pathetic. I can't believe they put jalapenos on my burger. Seriously? Seriously. That if I had control, I would go ahead and get in this person's face. And they didn't do this. I'm making that up. My own heart. I need to search out. We all need to search out. What is the source of our discontentment? If everyone around us weren't morons, would that change the contentment level of our heart? If everyone around us didn't behave like they did, and their job performance, according to me, was at the level I expected it to be, would I be content? The devil would like us to try to do that. And he'd like us to lead our families like that. He'd like us to lead our businesses like that. And it still wouldn't get us the contentment we want. What if we went the whole Christmas season without complaining? I know we're dreaming here, but let's dream. Let's dream. What if you got to the spot that when you checked Facebook on Christmas and that high school classmate you went to that was a jerk, he's got a picture of that brand new car he got as teenager, and your kid's still sharing a car with you? What if you were able to, from a pure heart, to rejoice with him and not give in to envy and jealousy? I can't believe that. What if that wasn't your default response? What would that do to your heart? What would that do to your levels of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness? What kind of example would that set for those around you? Those who work for you, those you work for, and those who live with you? What if we were a magnet because of our words instead of a repellent for Christ? What if contentment and not complaints flowed out of us? Could there again be, at Christmas time, a reason for joy to the world because we're around? Because we walked into the room that they knew that they were going to hear something that was encouraging? Now, let me give the backside here. Let's realize that not complaining does not mean we have to be compliant. It doesn't mean that if we're being abused or if a situation is going horrible that we cannot contend. Walking in contentment does not mean that you cannot contend for better ideas, improvement, or change. No one has yet tamed the tongue. And you won't be the first, but just because you can't tame it totally is not a reason to let it run freely. Just because you can't tame it totally is not a reason to let it run freely. We have more microphones than ever before. When you're ready to complain, step away from the microphone and no one will get hurt. The Facebook microphone, walk away. Walk away. The microphone where you've got an opportunity, the suggestion box at your place of employment, wait a day. Wait a day. Write it out, throw it away, and then wait a day. If, dream, dream with me. What if everyone around you, that you work for, that work for you, and that live with you, quit complaining for a month? How would that feel? It doesn't mean all of a sudden you're perfect, because let's face it, we're not. But what if everyone around you quit complaining for a month? What would happen to your heart? 
What would happen to your mind? What would happen to your confidence? What would happen to your money? What would happen to your spirit? What would happen to your love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness? Now let's face it. They're all not going to quit complaining. And you have no control over them. But what if you did? What if you went the entire Christmas season without complaining? What if you did? The cure for the common complaint is the cute title I threw on this message. And the cure for the common complaint is actually part of the cause of the common complaint. And it's control. It's on the screen. I forgot to click. Sorry. Click. There you go. The cure for the common complaint is still control. But what can we actually control? We cannot control our circumstances. We've tried. It's miserable. And we make everyone around us miserable. We cannot control the conduct of others. We've tried. It makes them miserable, then we get miserable. But what we can control is our own heart and our own attitudes. So I want to give you five simple steps that you could take. I'd be amazed if you just take one of them. If you just took one of them, it could change your heart. It lines up with God's word. Number one, count your blessings. Count your blessings, literally. Literally. I triple, double dog dare you to count your blessings. Last year at Thanksgiving, I actually did it. And I put it on the screen. I didn't want to repeat it for a thing. I was just repeating the same message. But I went ahead and took a sheet of paper. Actually, no, I didn't. I hate writing on paper. I took an open Word document <laughs> and just literally, stream of consciousness. What's 50 things I'm thankful for? Boom, 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 boom. I did just fine about 35. Then I had to work at it. Why would we think thankfulness would be natural? Complaining is natural. Could you come up with 50 things to complain about? Oh, yeah, come on. Give me a sheet of paper, Pastor. I'm ready to go. What about 50 things you're thankful for? And a number of people from the church actually went ahead and did that and posted it on Facebook. I put mine on the screen last year. Here's, the, here's what I'm thankful for. Count your blessings, literally. You have no problem going ahead. Here's the five things my football team did dumb yesterday. That's your fire that coach. What about here's five things that I'm thankful to God for? It'd be powerful. It's a redirection is what it is. Parents, you've done this. You won't buy me candy! Look at the flower, look at the flower! Oh, it's a pretty flower! <laughs> what is it called? Redirection because of an immature attitude. Because the kid's five and he got told he can't have candy. You may be as old as 48. Dear God, I hope you're not, but I am. But it doesn't mean that we don't need to purposely redirect when our heart is being tempted away by an enemy. To redirect and say, no, I'm not going to focus on that. Yeah, I wish my microphone would work. Yeah, but I'm not going to focus on that. Lord, I'm going to thank you. i got people to speak to today. We need to change, number two, change perspective. Every, every bit of words needs context, and complaints need a context. What's the context for our complaints? Turn the camera on yourself. Nobody likes it, except teenagers taking selfies. But turn the camera on yourself. If God hears every word and every thought that comes out of us, what would it be like to have God's view on our conversation for the day? I've done this. When I review my day, there's moments I'm going, thank you, God. There's other moments I'm going, Ew, I said that. Oh, man. <sighs> Hopefully it should drive us to repentance. Repentance isn't, isn't a fancy word that you use to beat yourself over the head with. It means I need to change the way I think and act. And that power is not going to come by my goodness or willpower. It's going to come from Christ in me. If we would review our day, we would repent. If we could see what God sees and what everyone else around us sees, we would see the words that come out of our mouth and the profanotype over our head that our faces communicate. Hey, how you doing? We would repent. Next, a cure for the common complaint is to confess it to God. You mean, Pastor, when I complain, I should say, God, I'm sorry I complained? You could do that. But I'm saying, actually, confess it. Tell God your complaint. Pray it out so you don't spray it out on everybody else. Pray it out to God so you don't spray it out on everybody else. Confess it. I need to get this off my chest. You're right. You do. But everyone around us, everyone around you, doesn't need to be on the receiving end of that. Especially if they don't have any power to do anything about it. If you don't talk it out to God, you'll end up taking it out on others. And then you'll regret you took it out on others and everyone's complaint level goes up high. And the love, joy, peace goes like this. Next, crush the entitlement mentality. Crush the entitlement mentality. But I deserve this. I've served God. I've done this. I've given my tithe. I deserve that. 
Anything you think you deserve, you're not grateful for. Think of something that you think you deserve. And if you don't have it, you're mad. And if you do have it, you're not grateful for it because you think you've got it coming anyways. When I check God's word and I look at God's word next to my life, I realize what I've got coming to me. And I don't want what I've got coming to me. I want God's grace instead. I'm not going to stand before God and say, give me what I've earned. <laughs> not a chance. I don't even want to go to my wife like that. Any, any man want to do that? Give me what I've earned? No one wants to. We know what we've earned. If we'll take a moment to step back and realize that our Savior, who had nothing, challenged us, if you're going to follow him, to deny ourselves daily and take up his cross. This is not a casting out thing. This is a daily crucifixion. Lastly, and maybe most practically, choose a healthier default response. Choose a healthier default response. And Brian, if you want to bring your team up, now would be good. Choose a healthier default response. What do I mean by default response? Your go-to response that you don't have to think about. Hey, how you doing today? Most people say, fine. And there's like 50 million ways to say it, isn't there? I'm fine. Fine. Or fine. I changed my default response about three or four years ago, literally. I changed it. Anybody know what it is? When I, I know you do. <laughs> Anybody know what it is? Dale, what is it? I'm blessed. I'm blessed. I'm blessed. Pastor, that's cute. It's fake, too. No, it's not fake. It's not fake. I'm blessed. Yeah, but you say it sometimes when you don't feel blessed. You're right. That's not fake. It's filtered. It's filtered. Feelings expressed unfiltered are foolish. Why would you not? Would you want your child walking around with a filter on their mouth? Yes, you do. You train them to do that. You want your employees to walk around with a filter on their mouth. It's a filter. If I'm not feeling blessed, I can still confess that I am blessed because I am blessed. I am wholly blessed. And sometimes I need to remind myself of that. It doesn't mean everything's awesome. It doesn't mean God's only giving me good things. It doesn't mean there's not difficulties. But I can look you in the eye anytime, 24-7 in the past 365, and be honest authentically. How am I doing? I'm blessed. I'm blessed. What's going wrong, Pastor? Oh, well, there's a couple of things I'd love to see different, but, but I'm blessed. What would happen if you changed your default response? I want to challenge you today. In a few moments, we're going to take communion. But as I was preparing this, I searched out online. I couldn't find it. couldn't find it in time for some sort of mechanism that we could use to remind ourselves this holiday season. I may do the same message again next Thanksgiving and be more prepared. Kind of like one of those WWJD bracelets, but a reminder about... Uh, not to complain, and not to punish ourselves and slap us when we complain, but just to change it to the other hand. Just a reminder that that's not the behavior I want to do. That's not the behavior I want to model for my kids. So I want to challenge you. You may not be a social media person. Maybe you can do something else with this. But I wrote a short, I don't know, creed, statement. It'll be on the flag Facebook at 10, and it will be in an email to you. But I want to take a moment and read it to you and challenge you to declare it yourself. It says this, From my own heart, I am taking aim for a complaint-free Christmas. I'm not expecting full compliance from my tongue, but the joy I have lost has not been worth my expressions of inconvenience. My lack of contentment flows from my own heart and not from the performance of those around me. Matthew 1, 2, 3, 4. For out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. It's as simple as one, two, three, four. Would you stand with me this morning? Can we bow our heads and hearts across this place? Father, you're good. You're good. There's things in our lives that stink, but you're good. And we're blessed. We are blessed. We thank you today for what you've done. 